Well, good morning once again. And uh, last month there was a group of us that had the opportunity to go down to Louisville, Kentucky and uh, went down for a conference called Together for the Gospel. And, and we got to hear some preachers from around the globe. Um, it, was, it was really a cool opportunity and uh, had a great time. Got to hear just some great preaching and teaching. And there were thousands uh, of people that were there. So to be able to worship the Lord with, with that many people, what a, what a cool experience that was. It, it was beautiful. The conference was held in, in downtown Louisville. Um, really beautiful location in the downtown region. They have a bunch of shops and, and restaurants, and, and uh, it's really neat. One of, the, one of the kind of unique things about it is they have, for transportation, they have all these electric scooters there. And uh, it was, at first, like, you kind of walk along, and there'd randomly be a scooter just right there. It's not chained to anything. It's just, like, I'm thinking, man, somebody's going to snag these. And then we realized you have to download an app on your phone, and then there's a barcode. You scan the barcode, and, and then you pay through your phone to be able to use these electric scooters. And they only work within certain, uh, a certain radius. So we're, we're just kind of noticing them randomly until a certain pastor's wife decided that we needed to rent some. Now, you could probably guess which pastor's wife that was. Um, in fact, her name is mentioned in our text today. But... Um, <laughs> But uh, she decided that, that we should ride these scooters. And by we, I mean she and Tabia and Sierra, the three pastors' wives. And so next thing you know, there's these three ladies. I have video footage too, but I just, it was too much for this morning. But um, they get on these scooters, and there they go. I mean, they leave. Paul and Tanner and I, we're sitting on the curb, just like, you know, lost puppy. Uh, kind of look on our faces. Um, we had we tried to discourage them from trying this. I just I'm like, honey, just please don't get hurt, right? I'm like, but I realized after almost 22 years of marriage, I was pretty confident she was going to take a scooter ride, um, and so she did. And and the next thing you know, they're gone. And I'm looking at my phone like, oh, they're I think they're a couple blocks that way. Um, you know, we're wondering when are they going to come back? Are they ever going to come back? No, we knew they'd come back, but when, then when they came back. Then they decided that we should give them a try, the three guys. And, um, and I was like, I, I don't really care to ride a scooter, whatever. And so we ended up having, finally, some of us rode the scooters and some of us did not. I'll leave you to figure out which one of us did or did not. But I, I say all that just to tell you this. You know, there's times in life where we got to make decisions, Right? And some are, are pretty easy decisions, like riding an electric scooter, which was a lot of fun. So that tells you it's down to two. But, um, but uh, and you can talk to those guys. Um, but it, you know what? There's decisions where there's, it's really simple, right? To ride the scooter or not to ride the scooter. And then there's other times in life where there's decisions or choices that are ones that really have to be made, Right? Where it's like, man, I, this has to be done. This has to take place. Well, this morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 8, and the title of this message is What Prevents You? And let me ask you this question. What prevents you from making the choices or decisions that you need to make? Like, are you just someone who's generally hesitant? Are you a little bit fearful? Are you like, you know what, I don't want to be pressured into anything. Don't pressure me. Don't. What prevents you from making decisions that you know need to be made. In fact, if I can be really specific, and I can, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, right? You're like, yeah, I, I really am a Christian. I really am a follower of Jesus. And you've never been baptized. What prevents you from being baptized? That's the question that we're going to ask today. And we're going to ask, it, ask that question pretty specifically the reality is, we've been going through the book of Acts, and as we've studied through this, we've noted whenever someone becomes a follower of Jesus, they're baptized. A lot of times, right on the spot. They were immersed in the waters of baptism, in essence, announcing to everybody that they're a follower of Jesus. And as we've talked, we've talked about baptism a lot, but the reality is this. Baptism is the outward expression of an inward reality, right? Right? 
It, it's the outward kind of sign for everybody. It's just letting, it's announcing to everybody what's true of what's inside of me, that I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm outwardly letting everybody know that outward expression of the inward reality that you're a follower of Jesus. In fact, in the first century, an unbaptized follower of Jesus was unheard of. Unheard of. In fact, maybe as we talk about baptism, the idea of what prevents you, maybe we've made it hard for you. I'm going to give you just a slight heads up here. We are going to remove all the things that might have prevented you from being baptized. In fact, today we have, uh, I, I believe, four individuals that are going to be baptized this service. And if you are a follower of Jesus and you've not been baptized, you can join them. I said that correctly, okay? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you've never been baptized, you can be baptized today. And you're, I know what you're thinking. I didn't bring anything. I'm not ready for that. I don't have any extra clothes. I don't have any. We've thought that through ahead of time for you, okay? We, we have, uh, if you've ever been to any of our baptism services here, we, have, we give everybody a t-shirt. We've got the t-shirts for you. We, we've got some shorts for you. We've got other things for you. Things I've never mentioned in any message before. Um, ladies, let me just put you, we had ladies help us prepare for this, okay? We are, we're ready for you to be baptized today. So whatever it is that's preventing you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've not been baptized, I want you to think about what's stopping you from being baptized. And you got like 15 minutes as I walk through this text today to think about that question. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it's the day of Pentecost, day one of when the church got started. Jesus died on the cross, he rose again the third day, and then after that, a matter of days after that, is the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and it says this, those who received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. Think about this, all right? This took place in the temple court area in Jerusalem, temple court is still the largest man-made platform in the world today. This took place in that area. It's a huge area. And off the southern steps of the temple court area, I've been there and I've seen they have what's known as mikvahs there. And mikvahs are ritual baths. All right, You walk down actually seven steps into a pool of water that they've cut right out of the rock. And it's really awesome. And they have a whole bunch of them there because people would come, Jews would come, and they'd want to come to the temple. But in order to come to the temple, you had to be cleansed. So they would come and they would wash themselves in these mikvahs right outside the temple court area. And it's believed that on the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people give their life to Christ and were baptized that same day, that they were baptized right there in those mikvahs. Last week we saw this same pattern that when someone got saved, they were baptized. Acts chapter 8, when, uh, it says, But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. See, when someone was saved, when they became a follower of Jesus, they, were, they got baptized that day. They got dunked that day. It wasn't something that was delayed it wasn't something where they had to like reach some level of spirituality that, quite honestly, it's not in the book, okay? When someone gave their life to Jesus Christ, they wanted to let people know, so they got baptized. That's what happened. They didn't really even have to decide. They would just, it was just something you did. It was something they wanted to do to announce that they were followers of Jesus. This morning, we're going to be having a baptism service like one you've never been a part of unless you were here at 9 a.m. this morning, okay? It, it's going to be a little bit different. But what we are going to do is we are prepared for those who are followers of Christ to be baptized today. And as I said, we've got some people that are, have already been lined up to do this. They've, can't, they've come to us in the last few weeks or whenever and said, you know what, I need to take this step. I need to be baptized. We've been announcing this. They've said that they want to do that. And, and, and we've talked with them, uh, made sure that they are followers of Christ. And I know maybe what some of you are thinking, if you're longtime churchgoers, you're like, wait, hold on. So somebody can just walk out the door and get baptized? We have a, we're going to have a team of people in the, in the lobby. And at some point here later in the service, you will clearly know 
I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond, and we're going to just have you go out into the lobby. We've got a team of people there ready to talk with you and ready to give you whatever you need in order to be baptized today. All right. So I want you to take that challenge and consider that for this morning. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Verse 26 is where where we're going to be starting. In Acts chapter 8, we've been seeing about how Philip went to Samaria. He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. A bunch of people are saved. In other words, they gave their life to, to follow Christ. It says, and then they were baptized. And then verse eight or chapter 8, verse 26 says this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, said, rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place, and he rose and went. Whenever you read about um, the situation, first of all, just as we look at this, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, that can be like a head scratcher a little bit. Like, wait, hold on, what happened here? Uh, An angelic being appeared to Philip and tells him to rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, it can be a little hard for us to wrap our minds around that. I could spend a long time talking about angels and explain some things. We don't have time to do that this morning, okay? That's for another, another time, another series. But what he tells Philip to do is to go to the road that goes down from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was elevated. Whenever you read about Jerusalem, usually you read about people going up to Jerusalem or going down from Jerusalem, and it's because of the altitude. And so he does this, and it says to go from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's a desert place. Can we just put ourselves in Philip's shoes just for a second? Let's say an angel appears to us. First of all, A, we're freaked out, right? Let's be real. Second of all, he tells him to go to the desert. I don't know about you. I would have had a number of questions, right? Hold on, uh, angel, Gabriel, whoever, Mike, I don't know. I got a couple questions first. We don't see that here. Look at how Philip responds. He just up and goes to the desert. I'd have been like, wait, wait, just, just go to the desert? Am I supposed to meet somebody? Is there a location? Is there some kind of an oasis out there? Like, am I going to be, what, what's going on here? Not Philip. Verse 27 says, he rose and went. He, and, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who is in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Not very often I come across my wife's name, so I was like, well, clearly I'm the one that's got to preach on this text here. Um, But uh, my wife's name is Candace. I don't know if you knew this, but Candace is actually the title of the queen. Similar to how in Egypt you have Pharaoh, who is clearly the king, right? He's clearly the leader. Uh, Candace is actually the title for a queen. So whenever you say hi to my wife, you're just calling her a queen, which is just, I think, very true, all right? (laughs) But really, this passage isn't about the queen as much as it is is about this individual who is in charge of all of her treasure. We don't have this guy's name, but he was a eunuch, and he was in, in charge of the queen of the Ethiopian's treasure, of all of her treasure. Let's just recognize for just a second here, this is clearly somebody that's, that's pretty trustworthy, right? He's probably somewhat high up if he's in charge of all of her treasure. He's someone who's responsible. He's someone who probably has some servants, probably has some potentially some bodyguards, right? And he's come to Jerusalem to worship. He's now returning to Ethiopia. He's in his chariot reading the prophet Isaiah. Verse 29 says, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. I don't know about you, but I'd have been like, Wait, that one? The one one over there? There's this realization of, listen, if you're a follower of Christ, when God's Spirit impresses something on your heart, just do it. God impresses on your heart to go talk to somebody. Go talk to that person. God impresses upon your heart to pray for someone. You wake up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden you got somebody on your mind. Pray for that person. When God puts something on your heart, do it. Philip says to the Spirit, go over and join this chariot. It'd be like us walking up to somebody's car and tapping on the window. Hey, can I talk to you for a minute? What? But that's what he does. He goes over him. He hears him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? Of course not. He's reading Isaiah. Isaiah is hard to understand. 
Verse 31, and he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And I couldn't help but think of Romans chapter 10. We mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. How will they hear if a preacher doesn't go? If someone doesn't preach to them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Listen, there are times when the Spirit impresses upon our hearts to do something, to say something, to go to someone, to ask a question like Philip does here. And I love Philip's approach, right? He doesn't go over and like knock on the chariot and like, have the Spirit told me I should come over and talk to you? No, no, no. He doesn't do that. He plays it cool. He just goes over and hears him reading Isaiah. Mental note, right? Okay, okay. And then just asks the question, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And then he responds, how can I unless someone guides me? What an open invitation to share. And this is what it says. Verse 32, now the passage of Scripture that he was reading was this. This is from Isaiah. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Well, of course he had questions. Of course, that's... that's Probably a lot of us at, at first glance would be like, I'm not quite sure what that's talking about either. I'm going to come back and, ex- and walk through some of that, but hang on here for a second. Just look at the conversation. Verse 34, And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or somebody else? Like, who's this passage in Isaiah talking about? Verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this Scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Listen, if you're somebody who's here, you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've joined us today, the reality is we need to open our mouth and share the good news of the gospel of Christ with those around us. That's what Philip does. And and I love how he starts. He starts right where this guy is at. He's not like, well, let me let me take you to this passage and explain this other one first, and then we'll give it. He just goes right to where he's at. Just goes right where he's at and says, hey, let's talk about this. And uses that opportunity to talk about the good news about Jesus. He uses this to point to Jesus Christ. Listen, we have no problem talking about all kinds of things, right? We could strike up all kinds of conversations. It shouldn't be that difficult to strike up conversations about Jesus Christ. If you're really a Christian, I mean, you really... It, you, you really claim to be? This, this should be something that we can do. We can talk about Jesus. We can just even simply talk about the reality of the difference He's made in our own hearts and our own lives. You don't have to have all the answers. Just talk about what He's done for you. Verse 36 says this, And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch, not Philip, the eunuch said, Look, see, Here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? I love that question. I love that he is immediately ready to profess his faith in Jesus Christ. He's clearly made a decision. There's probably some bits and pieces of this conversation that we don't have. But the reality is, at some point here, he has made a decision to follow Jesus as his Lord and his Savior, and now he's ready to take his next step in obedience and be baptized. So let me pose his question, the Ethiopian eunuch's question, to you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, what prevents you from being baptized? Think about that. Maybe if if it's you, you think like, man, uh, you, you it's, I've seen some of them here and some people get up and they, they talk a lot and they tell their story and that's really cool, but I don't think I could do that. You don't have to do that. If you're someone who clearly professes your faith in Jesus Christ, you don't, you don't have to get up here and share your entire past. I had somebody who was like, I don't feel comfortable sharing my whole story. That's okay, you don't have to. But the Bible does make it clear that those who are followers of Jesus Christ are to be baptized. So let me go back to where we started in the beginning this morning in Acts. When someone becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, they are baptized. Let me pose this question 
a little more specific for you. What prevents you from being baptized today? I told you, we have everything that you need. We had some people that, that came this morning to the first service that responded to the message and walked out the door, met with some people, talked with them. We gave them some clothes to get changed in and went, they went and got baptized. That was pretty awesome. What prevents you, if you're really a follower of Jesus Christ, what prevents you from being baptized today? Listen to what Jesus himself said. Some of his parting words to his disciples, and really it's to us, the church at large, right? He says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Some of the last things that he says are to make disciples. We, we talk about it all the time. It's, it's right out on the wall in the lobby that we are all about making passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Making disciples. This is where that comes from. And a part of making disciples is that when someone places their faith in Jesus Christ, verse, 12, or verse 19, they're to be baptized. And they're to profess that faith in Jesus Christ. And, and by the way, if you study the grammar of this text, it's a command. This is something that Jesus commands. Make disciples. Go, baptize, and teach. Now as we talk about baptism today, I want you to understand some things very clearly about baptism. Number one, looking at the biblical model of baptism, right? This is not Ben's model. This is God's model, okay? It's what the Bible says about baptism. Number one, baptism follows salvation. There's some things that are really important to understand about baptism. As you study the New Testament, you will see that baptism follows salvation. Someone gives their life to Christ. They respond to that action with the action of being baptized. They aren't baptized to be saved. Huge difference, okay? Baptism, baptism is done to proclaim that you already are a follower of Jesus Christ. You've probably heard, heard this before, but baptism is not required for salvation. Baptism is done as a result of salvation. There's a big difference. This is one of the reasons why, why we don't baptize babies. I have an 18-month-old, and he can get out Dada and Mama and some of his siblings' names and he can say more when he wants more to eat, and he can say stinky when he needs his diaper changed, right? Beyond that, he doesn't really communicate a whole lot unless he kind of screams and yells at you. And then you're trying to figure out what he's trying to communicate. He's not able to profess that he's a follower of Jesus Christ. Because he's not. He's not old enough. He's not old enough to even understand those concepts yet. So certainly we aren't to have them baptized. It's really important to understand that. Baptism follows salvation. It's done as a result of salvation. Babies, little kids, they really don't profess their faith in Christ. I had, I had, a, had a kid that responded in the first service, I say kid, I think teenage years, that they gave their life to Christ when they were like eight years old. And they understood at that age the, the concept of salvation and their need to place their faith in Jesus as the one who died on the cross for their sin. They could figure that out at that age range. But sometimes in those younger years, they, don't, they aren't old enough to grasp it yet. And then they recognize this morning, like, hey, it's pretty clear in Scripture, I need to be baptized. And they took that step. Number two, baptize means to immerse. I want to talk about the word baptize. The, the New Testament was written originally in Greek in the first century. And the first century Greek word that's used for, for baptize or baptism in the New Testament is the Greek word baptizo. And that word means to immerse or it means to submerge or it means to dunk under. It's a word that Greeks would use in literature to describe a ship that was sunk. Totally sunk, submerged, underwater. It, it was a word that clearly talked about the idea of something going completely under. And we're like, well, so how are these, all these different thoughts about? I mean, some sprinkle, some dunk. We, we dunk them here. How, how did it get 
to the place where they distinguish this differently. And the reality is this. When they took the Greek New Testament and started to translate it into English, they really did a disservice to this word baptizo. By then, there was already some churches that were dunking and some that were sprinkling, and they didn't want to cause a stir. So they're like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this Greek word, baptizo, and we'll just make it sound English. We'll call it baptize. So really, you've been using a Greek word. You didn't even know you knew Greek, right? The word baptize, it's a Greek word. It means to immerse. A better translation of this would be immerse. That they were saved and immersed. Completely put underneath the water. And so when you understand that, you understand that the word baptized means to immerse. Number three, baptism is a beautiful picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 6, 4. He says this, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And there's a reality that as somebody is baptized, they go under the water and they come back up again. And it's a beautiful picture of how Christ died for our sin at the cross, of how he was buried and how he rose again the third day. Today, we really have done our best to remove anything that would prevent you those who are followers of Jesus Christ, from being baptized. Last week, I made it clear, you really won't have to share your whole story. I had somebody that just wanted to say one short sentence this morning in the first service, just to let everybody know who they are. But the reality is, as, as we think about this today, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we're to be baptized. And so we've talked about this reality today of what prevents you from being baptized today. I, I love this story about the Ethiopian eunuch. And, and the reality was, he comes to water and he says, look, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And we want to pose that question for you. Look, there's water right here. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, what prevents you from being baptized today? In Acts chapter 8, verse 38, it says this, that he, the Ethiopian eunuch, commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and Philip baptized him. You know, as I thought about this a little bit, there's a couple of things that are, are neat about this, but the reality is this water wasn't clean. They're in the desert. It's windy, it's dusty. This is dirty water. And yet he recognized the importance of baptism, of letting his whole entourage know that he was truly a follower of Jesus Christ. He didn't care that the water was dirty, he didn't care that he was a person of position and power. Well, I can't go down, I can't get dirty, I can't do that. We'll have to wait till we're back. And no, 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 no. Nothing prevented him from announcing to those right there with him that he was a follower of Jesus Christ right then and there. So what prevents you today? Here's what we're going to do. In just a minute, I'm, I'm going to dismiss those who are going to be baptized and those who are help, helping prepare. And as I said, we're going to have some people ready for you. If you want to join them, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count backwards from five, five to, to one. And those who are being baptized, those who are helping out, we want you to just go right to the back doors, to go right out into the lobby, and we will point you in the right direction. What prevents you from being baptized today? If you want to be baptized, you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You've placed your faith in him and his work at the cross. We invite you to be baptized today. So if you're being baptized, if you're helping out, Five, four, three, two, one. Go right ahead. Go right out back. That's great. The rest of you, sorry, you're stuck with me for a little bit, okay? Don't worry, about 10 more minutes before we see these individuals baptized. I love that, that the Ethiopian eunuch here, he didn't wait. 
He was saved and he was baptized. I want to point out something that's, that's really kind of unique about this passage. If you are, are like me, I, I use the, the English Standard Version. Um, and maybe you already noticed, noticed this, but there's no verse 37. Anybody notice? Anybody pick up on that? Anybody, anybody grab that? Oh, we got a couple. Yeah, great. There's no verse 37 in, in there. In fact, mine has a footnote, and if you go to the bottom, it's written in there. But this, this passage is kind of unique because it's not, verse 37, is not uh, written in all uh, text and manuscripts. But verse 37, in, in the few manuscripts that it's in, it says this, and Philip said to him, right after he said you know, this, this realization of, of, of this passage from Isaiah, Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I mean, the reality is this guy makes some kind of a statement, whether verse 37 was, is supposed to be in here or not, he makes some kind of a statement. In fact, I love how MacArthur puts this. He, he says this about this verse. The oldest and most reliable manuscripts do not contain verse 37, okay? That's why, like in the ESV, you don't find it. Which should be omitted from the text. Shouldn't be there, he says. Still, and, and, this is, and I love how he clarifies this. He's like, still, something like that confession must have occurred. Like, listen, it's not worth splitting hairs over. The reality is some kind of a statement was made by this guy to let Philip know that he really was a follower of Jesus Christ. And whether it's what we have written exactly here in verse 37 or something different, we don't really know. But he, we do know that he makes it clear that he is a follower of Jesus Christ. He makes it clear that he believes that Jesus died on the cross for his sin. So verse 38 then, the, he commanded the chariot to stop. They went down into the water and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. Talk about another part that's, that's difficult to wrap our minds around. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. It, it didn't even matter to him that like, the reality was all of a sudden Philip disappears. The Spirit of the Lord, it says, carries him. Look, notice what happens there. Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. But the reality is this guy keeps going and he is rejoicing all along the way. He's rejoicing about what the Lord has done. He's rejoicing about the reality that he is a follower of Jesus Christ. He's rejoicing that he's taking this step in baptism, even if he's covered in now muddy water that's starting to dry up and he's pretty filthy. He doesn't care. He's rejoicing. I love that about it. I told you I'd go back to what, what Philip talked uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch in, in regards to Isaiah the prophet. Verse 30, let's back up to verse 30. It says this, Philip ran to him, remember, he goes up to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? He invites Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is what he read, verse 32, like a sheep... He was led to the slaughter like a lamb before its shears of silence, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. This passage is Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. And if we were to walk back there and go through all that, you'd, you'd see that that's what this individual was reading. You know what's interesting about Isaiah 53 and the book of Isaiah in general? It was written 700 years before Jesus was born. Written 700 years before Jesus was born, and yet it's written about Jesus. Come on in, kids. They're coming in because they want to see these individuals get baptized today. The scrolls, go ahead, right into the second row, guys. Go right ahead. Right here, right in the second row. Awesome. Right there, go ahead. Keep going, keep going, keep going all the way to the end. There we go. It's all good. We got this, right? So what, what happens here is he explains this passage here from Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 is clearly about Jesus Christ. It's clearly about His death on the cross. It's written 700 years before He's even born. And you're like, wait, hold on a second. Time out. How do we know that? They've actually found manuscripts. In fact, they've found 
copies of manuscripts that were written before Jesus' birth in a location called Qumran in Israel. Some of you have been there. Mark and Kathy were there with us. What a, what a privilege to be able to go there. And they found what's known as the Dead Sea Scrolls there. And they're manuscripts that are dated pre the birth of Jesus Christ. They found these pieces of them and they put them in their museum in Israel, their national museum. You can go there. I've been to the museum. I've seen portions of some of these manuscripts, these ancient manuscripts that were dated B.C., before Christ, that are there in the National Museum. And one of those that they found was Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he was pierced. Clearly speaking about Jesus on the cross. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. We can find spiritual healing. We can find the payment of our sin from Jesus at the cross. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That was written long before the birth of Jesus. Written clearly about his death on the cross. Paul would later write this in the New Testament, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we're justified, we're declared right before God by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward, God put his own son forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. In other words, he put him forward kind of as that substitution for us. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. A couple chapters later, Paul says this, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. That's every single one of us. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want to tell you a story just before we close here. True story. When John Cavanaugh, the noted and famous ethicist, went to Calcutta, he was seeking to meet Mother Teresa. He went there for three months to work at the house of the dying to find out how best he could spend the rest of his life. When he met Mother Teresa, he asked her to pray for him. What do you want me to pray for, she asked. He then uttered the request that he had brought for thousands of miles. Pray that I have clarity. His prayer request was for clarity. No, Mother Teresa responded. I will not do that. When he asked her why, she said, clarity is the last thing you are clinging to and must let go of. And when Kavanaugh said that she always seemed to have clarity, the very clear, kind of clarity he was looking for, Mother Teresa laughed and said, I have never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. So I will pray that you trust in God. You know, the question we've been presenting this morning is, is about baptism and what prevents somebody, a follower of Christ, from being baptized. Let me ask another question just as we close here. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, what prevents you from becoming a follower of Christ today? What's holding you back? Maybe you're like John Kavanaugh and you're looking for clarity when all you really need is trust. All you really need is to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And if that's you, we'd invite you today to ask Jesus to be the leader of your life and the forgiver of your sin. Accept the reality that Jesus died on the cross and that he died for my sin and yours. And that the only way that that sin could ever be paid for, the only way that we can ever have a relationship with God is by placing faith in Jesus and what he has done for us. Reality is there's probably a group of individuals waiting right back here in the office right now that have already made that decision. They've already placed their faith in Jesus Christ. 
And they want to announce that to us by being baptized today. As we close, let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, we come before you this morning. We thank you and we praise you for our time together, our time in the Word, our opportunity to be able to study and to be able to look at your Word and to discuss it. And Lord, we thank you for these individuals that are taking their next step and they're being baptized today. We thank you for their boldness to act in obedience to what Christ has commanded us to do. God, I want to pray for those who are not followers of Christ, that they would recognize their need for Jesus today. I pray for those who are followers of Christ that have maybe have already been baptized, been a follower of Jesus for years. I pray that we would look to the example of Philip and that we would be bold with our faith, that we would open our mouth and we would tell others about Jesus Christ. God, we ask your blessing now on the rest of this service. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul.